In this week's show, we're going to go back to school with Jorge Armenteros from Tobacconist University. In the Debonair Ideal segment, my illustrious guest co-host this week, Dave Burke from the Cigar Jukebox podcast, will be with, be with me even to talk about a yet undetermined topic. In the Stogies of the Week, I will give my thoughts on some infused cigars. So stay tuned. All that and more coming up next. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady. It's the Stogie Geek Show. Paying homage to the mecca of tobacco, Pinar del Rio, Cuba, Abe Flores opened his PDR cigar factory in the Dominican Republic over 10 years ago. Abe is one of the hottest boutique cigar makers in the industry today, earning the number 10 spot on Cigar Aficionado's Top 25 Cigars of 2014 with the Abe Flores 1975 Siri Pravada. Abe and his team use Cuban blending traditions in a modern boutique Dominican factory. Smoke PDR cigars and cut, light, and taste what they love to do. Saga Cigars, makers of the Saga Golden Age. The Golden Age is a cigar that takes you back to the classic days of cigar smoking. Through the six generations of experience by the Reyes family, the Saga Golden Age delivers a timeless blend that uses the nobility of the tobacco to bring you the perfect balance of power and flavor. It narrates better than words the history of a family's tradition in tobacco, delivering a cigar much like the ones they used to smoke in the times of Hemingway. Saga Golden Age is a full-bodied, full-flavored Dominican Puro. With tobaccos from one farm, the blend features a Carrojo 2006 wrapper and filler from original Cuban seeds grown in the Dominican Republic. Available in four sizes at an affordable price, the Saga Golden Age is sure to please and take you back on a journey to yesteryear. If you created the Aging Room Small Batch Cigar Line, the highest rated boutique cigar brand of our times, what would you do next? Well, if you're Raphael Nodel from Boutique Blend Cigars, you would combine your three most important passions of your life, Cuba, music, and cigars, and create a new classic, La Boheme Cigars. La Boheme is Raphael's take on the golden age of Cuban cigars. La Boheme is a sophisticated blend of extra aged and hard to find tobaccos from the Dominican Republic. A medium bodied cigar, rich in flavors reminiscent of the island he left 35 years ago in a small boat with his family. Why wait for the embargo to be lifted? Smoke La Boheme today. Blending is in our DNA. Partagas, since its introduction in 2014, Partagas 1845 Extra Fuerte has won critical acclaim and a devoted legion of fans. Flawless construction and full-bodied flavor are the hallmarks of this rich, dimensional cigar that features prevalent notes of wood and coffee. Made with a unique blend spanning three continents, Partagas 1845 Extra Fuerte is the perfect choice for any cigar smoking occasion. Welcome everyone to the Stogie Geek Show. This is episode 164. Did I get that right? I think I got that right. It is 164. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, and I am delighted to be here with my illustrious guest co-host this evening, Mr. Dave Burke from the Cigar Jukebox Podcast, broadcasting all the way from Australia. Welcome, Dave, to the show. Hello. Thank you, Paul, for having me on. It's great to be here. It is wonderful to have you. Thank you for joining us this evening, Dave. Um, what are you smoking tonight? I'm smoking um, the Sobre Mesa from Steve, Steve Saka's new cigar. Now, how did you get that all the way in Australia before I get it? Well, as a matter of fact, I uh, interviewed Steve this morning for Cigar Jukebox, and he was kind enough to send me some to have before the interview. Yeah, he said he was going to send me some, too. So I didn't, like, try and go buy any because he was going to send me some samples. And, uh, yeah, well, I'm sure they're on the way. Steve is a great guy. I don't mean to give him crap on the air like I just did. But um, so <laughs> no, what, do you, but it, what do you think? I mean, it's one of my most anticipated cigars to smoke, Dave, uh, which is why I'm so excited about it. I know it came to some retailers uh, in Massachusetts. It hasn't actually come 
here to Rhode Island yet that I know of, although I've been slacking. I haven't made it to some of my local uh, brick and mortars uh, this week, uh, so it very well could be at some of my, my local stores. Um, next door is easy to check, right? Some of the other ones are a, a little farther. It's Rhode Island. Everything's close, so I really have no excuses. So what do you think of it so far? Uh, well, I'll talk about it as for my cigars uh, still okay. this week as well, but it is – it's tremendous. It's it's very good, um, and I think it will even get better with a bit of age. It's a little – it's a little more subtle than the Liga Privada that he's known for, but extremely complex and uh, excellent construction. Nice. I can't wait. Uh, I'm smoking the Lenox by La Flor Dominicana. This is a, a Brazilian wrapper with a San Andreas Mexican binder and Dominican filler. Uh, it's a 6x52 Toro. And um, it is one of my favorites to come out from La Flor Dominicana. It is just, it's medium bodied, it has so much flavor. I, I'm really digging these sticks. So have you smoked this one yet, Dave? No, I have it on my uh, wish list because um, I've just sort of seen it around and I've heard about it. But I've heard really great things. I've heard it's tremendous, like a tremendous cigar. Yeah, I'm smoking this in the absence of Mr. Will Cooper, who couldn't be with us this evening. When Will was here, he was supposed to take some of these back with him to review and sample and smoke, and he forgot them. And I like them so much that I'm smoking them, and I'm, I'm hoping that he can find a retailer uh, where he's in North Carolina and, and get some for him to review. Um, as I don't believe he's reviewed it yet, either on the show or for the blog, cigar So, Well, hey, you know, if he leaves them there, they're, they're um, free game. That's it. They're fair game. I'm smoking them. Uh, I'd like to introduce our very special guest for this evening. I have his book here, which I have been reading, and uh, Jorge, this is probably one of the greatest compliments. I had to retrieve your book from my bathroom, which is where all of us do our most serious reading. Uh, Jorge Amenteros, uh, who is from a Tobacconist University. Welcome, Jorge. Hey, what's up? Thank you for having me. Yes, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Um, so, Jorge, how did you get started in the cigar industry? Wow. Well, I was going to American University in Washington, D.C., and uh, I met a retired um, spy who spent his off time working at Georgetown Tobacco, and uh, it intrigued me. I had smoked cigars on and off, and I went to Georgetown Tobacco, and I remember the moment I walked into that amazing store and I fell in love with the industry. Um, and, uh, there was no turning back. That was right about the time the first issue of Cigar Aficionado came out. Right, right. Um, so Jorge, what, um, what is your exact involvement today with, uh, Tobacconist University? Well, I'm the president and the founder, and I've developed most of the curriculum. Uh, I started it in 1996. I started it to start to educate my own tobacconist. I have over 20 years of retail experience as an owner uh, to a retail tobacconist owner in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And uh, I developed the curriculum to educate my own tobacconists. And ultimately, um, in about 03, I decided to turn it inside out and make it available to the whole world, basically. Mm, that's really cool. So when you were developing a curriculum for the tobacconists that work in retail, what were like some of the top three things that you felt was kind of like a gap in their knowledge that – you, you really wanted to instill on them? Well, well, there's so much subjectivity in the industry, and that's okay, but I think it's important to know when you're being opinionated and subjective. So we'll say that's one thing. Mm. The, the second thing was humidification system. So pe people didn't have any idea what propylene glycol did, and you'd come in with a humidor that wouldn't take, or a humidifier that wouldn't take water, and a lot of tobacconists would put more propylene in it, which was the exact opposite of what needed to happen. And uh, number three, um, it's hard to say, but just simple fundamental things that we all needed to agree upon, like 80% of lighter problems are just learning how to fill a butane lighter. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we were doing before the show, you had the sense to purge your lighter and then fill it. But when you're filling a butane lighter, a torch or a similar lighter with butane, you're going to keep filling it and then pumping more oxygen in it if you don't purge it or that is let all of the oxygen out. 
So there are so many fundamental things that we lacked. Right. And right. so much subjectivity as the internet grew and as the industry grew and so much bad and misinformation. Mm. So, but, you know, those are the top three BS things. Ultimately, I thought as a profession, we needed credibility, fighting smoking bans and taxation and all of those things. So that was the inspiration to really develop it and make it an international curriculum. What I want to ask you this question, Jorge, because we, we all see this, those of us in cigar media, people who work in retail, um, when you're just hanging out you know, at your local cigar lounge. What are some of the top misconceptions that people have about cigars? That they know something. You know, <laughs> I mean, you talk to the biggest gene, you talk to Jose Orlando Padron and, um, you know, 89, 98% of the media geniuses on the interweb, you sit in front of him and you tell him all your fancy adjectives and words. And he's going to say, it tastes like tobacco. So it's esoteric. It's ethereal. It's a mistake to think, you know, too much, you know, it's, um, I think that the great cigar makers, are artists and they um, they feel it more than they can speak it, so to say, or so to speak. Um, so to think you know something, you know, you'll be proven wrong the next day. Um, tobacco is very gray and it's always been very difficult, gray in, in terms of there's very little black and white. Mm. And with TU, it's always been very difficult to say this is a fact or that's a fact. So it, we have to be open to opinion and um, and people have to know uh, and not pontificate and be willing and open to say, this is just my opinion. Like if I'm pairing this cigar with that drink or I think this cigar is better, well, there's no such thing. I mean, taste is subjective. You know what's interesting, Jorge, as, as I read your book and I research uh, some very technical things. I'm a very technical person in nature. My background is computers. And when I start researching the, the different plant types and plant varieties – I, you know, read articles where there's people from the industry quoted in the article, and they all kind of have a different story. So even when you talk about something that's as technical as the botany around the different plant varieties, there's discrepancies in people's stories. Yeah, well, that's a pretty way to say it. <laughs> so what, uh, let's go, I want to talk about the plants, and I want to talk about the, some of the roots of uh, tobacco plants where it all started. I mean, there's the, the, the basic varieties broken down into Criollo and, and Corojo. Is that, is that a good place to start? Sure. I mean, that's a, a general classification so that we can establish some kind of fundamental agreement and have a discussion. But, you know, then there's, you know, you could just simply say there's maybe five types of uh, dark air cured tobaccos in the world. Well, wherever you want to start. Um, yeah, let, well, let's start um, with with uh, Criollo, for example. What, what are some of the, the history? Like, it, And break it down. I mean, most people that listen to the show, right, we're stogie geeks. We may have known that we smoked a cigar that had Criollo tobacco in it, but we don't understand some of the history behind it. We don't understand some of the properties of it or know even what it means. Well, it's simply a Habano seed, just like a Corojo is. Um, Believe nothing you hear or read. I mean, it's all marketing hype in the end. Uh, Corojo and Criollo are super similar, mm -hmm. except for minute differences that make one better for filler and one better for wrapper. Um, and then you have Corojo is very difficult to grow. For example, I'm smoking a Brazilian Corojo cigar. Brazilian Corojo, the wrapper at least, is extremely difficult to grow in Brazil. It was grown by... Uh, Jose Fuego for the first time in Brazil. And so on this cigar, there's a Habano binder that's grown in Brazil. Well, there's probably not a single human being on the planet that could tell the difference between Corojo that's grown in Brazil and Habano that's grown in Brazil. Or maybe there's three people that could tell the difference. Mm -hmm. Very nuanced. Um, I think we tend to make, we be, tend to be specific and get specific to teach a point or to pretend like we know stuff. But in the end, you ask a lot of these amazing cigar makers and, and you're telling them that you taste chocolate and almond and coconut and they'll say it tastes like tobacco. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point. Um, I think the media tries to reach out and 
to say something interesting about the cigar, they try and relate it to other flavors. Um, but like you're saying, there's I agree, there's three people in the world that can differentiate some of these different um, wrapper types. Now, did did much of it originate in Cuba, or are there there are other roots that uh, it, it ties back to? Well, Cuba is the birthplace of dark air cured cigar tobaccos, and that's a sad irony in their case because you know they lost that leadership role. I mean, Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. even what the Placencias do in Honduras, the Padrones in Nicaragua, the Puentes in the DR, the Casadas, Kellner, you know, 10, 15 years ago when the Cubans raised their prices, it wasn't because their product got better. It's because they saw what the Padrones and the Puentes were charging everywhere else mm -hmm. in the world. Right, right. What, what do you, when, when people ask you, Jorge, um, about Cuban tobacco, like what's your what's your kind of take on Cuban tobacco? And I've heard everyone's opinion from, you know, a huge spectrum of opinions on Cuban tobacco, on Cuban cigars. You know, what's your, your opinion on Cuban cigars? Well, I resent um, the ethno stereo typical uh, projection that you're putting on me, but I get asked it all the time. <laughs> I own, you know, two retail stores in two states. That's what pays my mortgage. And... Um, you know, I, I think great cigar makers are artists and a centrally planned economy cannot make great artistic products. And I think that that's proven. So like anybody, I think who knows stuff will tell you they have great natural resources. Um, they could really exploit that or develop it. But it's, um, you know, that's that's yet to be seen. And we are at least a decade away from seeing great Cuban cigars at the level of what we're smoking from the DR in Central America, mm. in my opinion. No, I, I, I completely agree. Um, when we look at those other, uh, those other countries, what are some of the processes that uh, contribute to some of those great cigars coming out from Nicaragua and Dominican? When we, we talk about the tobacco and the different type of plants and, and hybrid seeds and all that stuff, what, what are some of the things that go into that whole process to, to make such great tobacco? I think, well, I love that question, and I have a terrible answer for you. But I think what makes great cigars is nuance. It's the dozens of tiny steps that you and I cannot fathom the implications of. So a Hendrik Kellner, you know, Hendrik uh, Kellner is amazing. He makes David off, he makes Paul Garmerian, but then... He, he went with Davidoff and he made this Nicaraguan cigar. Mm. And when you smoke that cigar, you taste Hendrik Kellner's finesse and nuance in that cigar. And it's amazing that he could translate his artistry into a cigar that's totally different than anything he ever did. So I don't think that the varietals matter, so to speak, in general, as much as the nuance and the artistry of these cigar makers. And he's never going to tell you every little secret he has. Right. And then right. when he tells you a half dozen of them, you're not even going to understand it. You know, I'm constantly hearing from a lot of these cigar makers. Oh, I'm going to hot box that wrapper. It's a micro fermentation. I don't even know if that's real. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> but they're constantly doing little tiny things. And they know. And it translates onto our palates. But uh, ultimately, and quite frankly, I think, um, to the laymen, and we are laymen, uh, not cigar makers, not men in the field and in the dirt and the agriculture. Um, just another, you know, short story. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Nestor Placenti, who's an amazing agricultural um, behemoth in the world. And mostly everybody uses a lot of his tobacco. And I've been in the fields with him, and he'll look at a field and say, that's a little lighter and green than this. And I think we have to adjust this and nitrogen and I don't know what. And I look at the field and it's all the same color. Mm -hmm. So nuanced and they're so artistic and they're so expert. You know, you have to live it, breathe it. And they do. And they do it 18 hours a day. And um, it's extraordinary. You can't keep up with these guys. They're 70, 60, 70, 80 years old. And I would uh, argue that none of us can keep up with them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or one of the questions that came up recently that I reserved for you, 
Um, and it's the first time we've ever really asked this on the show. And when we were researching different types of tobacco and the, you know, the growing process and cultiva- cultivating process, um, we, we hear like the hybrid seeds and how they take two plants and they make a new strain. Well, what, is, what is that process? And we've tried to read articles about how you do that with your tomato plants, right? But like, I'm not a botanist. It doesn't make sense to me. Can you, can you shed any light on how they're creating all these new different strains of tobacco? Everything is a cross-pollination. The original Nicotiana tobacco doesn't exist. Mm. It's not even found growing in the wild. <clears throat> so every thing you've ever smoked is a hybrid of something. You know, it's cross-pollination, and they do it with tomatoes, as you said. They do it with orchids. Um, what's difficult is if you grow a tomato, you can taste it tomorrow, right, or in three months. But when you're doing with tobacco... You're not going to taste it for a year, 18 months, so to speak, to really get a sense of it. Um, but these cigar makers, the ag- agricultural cigar makers, mm-hmm. all they do is experiment. If they know how to grow this Corojo or that Criollo, that's going. They got great farmers, great assistants. But really what they're doing is focusing on the future. What are we going to be smoking in five years? And... There's a lot of artistry in it, but it's no different than any sort of hybridization of any plant, except that it takes longer to really taste it. And we count on their palates to bring it to us. Right, right. What, what advice do you have for the consumer in understanding and kind of interpreting the different types of tobacco that are going in their cigar? And of course, there are manufacturers that release all the details and they say this is Dominican, you know, Piloto Cubano and this is, you know, the Brazilian Habano. Um, what, what advice do you have to kind of navigate all of these different strains of, of tobacco? Oh, I, you know, I hope you'll have me on again. I don't want to let you down with my answers, but yeah. <laughs> ignore everything they tell you because all of these words are simply empty words. That mean nothing because one guy can grow a corojo that's this, that, X, Y, Z, and the same guy will grow it somewhere else. And one's great and one's terrible. You're it's right, the nuances right. that makes the difference. Mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. verbal masturbation is called marketing. Forget about that. <laughs> I'm a retail tobacconist, and that's uh, the people I serve and love, and that's what made me fall in love with this industry. You know, ultimately, smoke all the cigars you can. That's the only way to get experience and to really – um, grow to understand your taste and um, the labels and the words that in the marketing terms you put on it means nothing. Um, know what you like. And the only way to know what you like is to smoke it, you know, the experience. So I, I never, ever, ever forgot. And my grandfather smoked cigars. My dad, I, I grew up with it. You know, I had my first cigar like four years old for my first pup. <laughs> but I, I never forgot how intimidating it was to go into a cigar shop, Georgetown Tobacco, in the early 90s. My first, like, premium cigar experience. And looking at all these products and the beautiful bands, and everybody was extremely helpful. But it didn't matter how helpful they were. I needed to smoke 500 cigars or 200 cigars to even develop a vernacular or to be able to communicate what I felt. And whatever that great tobacconist behind the counter was telling me didn't mean I understood it because my words were different. So... Forget about the words. Forget about the labels. It's all marketing jargon. Smoke cigars. You know, figure out what you like and use your own words. And if somebody tells you something with absolute certainty, throw that out. Don't believe it for a second because there's no such thing. And the best cigar in the world is whatever your favorite is because taste is subjective and it doesn't matter what Ligero or Criollo or blah, blah, blah. What advice do you have for people that um, along the lines of developing their palate? So to be able to understand and appreciate the flavors in a cigar, um, to pair it with different things. Like what advice do you have for people to get the most out of what what cigars they're smoking? Experience is everything. And I'm a, I'm a solo smoker. I don't smoke a lot at work. I'm not a conversational smoker. I could be at work all day and not have a cigar in the retail store. And then I get in the car and light one up. But I think the greatest way to learn about cigars is to smoke with a friend that you can have a dialogue and a conversation with and smoke the same cigar. And if he says it's nutty and you say it's like caramel, 
So maybe the truth is somewhere in between. But that dialogue that is created, because it's not objective, what your brain and your nose and your palate sense, it's not an objective reality. That's your subjective experience. But smoking with people and discussing it, knowledgeable people, or just any person, that's the greatest way to learn about it and understand what you're feeling and what they're feeling might be different, but at least somewhere in the middle is probably an objective reality. But there are some objective things about cigar smoking, such as some of the ways you cut and light a cigar, pairing with orange juice being a really bad idea, right? I will agree with you, but that's my opinion, because if I have a customer that says, I love to smoke and drink orange juice, then there, I have no place telling that person they don't have any right to prefer that. Mm. I mean, so we can agree, but I'm not going to tell any other freedom-loving human being that they have no right to drink orange juice with their cigar. Mm. No, I agree. I agree. I, in, you know, we agree that orange juice isn't necessarily the best pairing. So um, We agree with people, but I do not want to pontificate to people how they should and what they should smoke with. Mm. Um, so, Jorge, what... Um, You've obviously smoked a lot of cigars in your lifetime. What, what, is, what are some of your favorite cigars that you tend to always go back to and, and smoke? Or do you just have a continuing rotation? I'm not that adventurous. But you were talking, you are smoking a La Fleur, right? That's correct, yes. One of the cigars that I have in my um, walk-in at home is uh, the Museo. What mm. an amazing, crazy, ridiculous cigar. Um... You know, Lido killed it with that one. Uh, I love a Padron lover. Uh, I love a lot of Fuentes. I'm a huge Pete Johnson Tatuaje lover. I smoke fuller body cigars typically, um, and that's that's my rotation. Mm. But no. you know, I I have a good story though. Uh, in eight seconds or less, yeah, uh, Tatuaje was offered to one of my retail stores or both of them many many years before they became super famous, and we're like, yeah, whatever. It's, that's decent. You know, it took us three years to catch on, but that's an amazing brand. You don't always spot the winners. Mm. You could smoke it on an off day. You may not like the salesman. Your pH balance could be off on your palate or whatever. So you you don't always know or, and catch the great ones coming. Mm. Um, you said you like to smoke fuller body cigars. A lot of the trends that I'm seeing in the market today is with Connecticut shade cigars and lighter cigars. Um, what's your opinion on that trend, and what are some of your favorite Connecticut cigars? Oh, wow. Uh, yes. <laughs> <Not really. laughs> well, you know, it's a beautiful wrapper. I love Connecticut Broadleaf. Uh, you know, in the 80s and 90s, I smoked Macanudos and the Cuesta Rays. Um Taste is subjective. It's it's not my, you know, I don't enjoy, like, boiled chicken. I like grilled meats. Yeah, no, and that definitely speaks to the differences in people's uh, palates. My Mine tends to change throughout the day. In the morning, I do like to smoke, and I do like to smoke Connecticut's because my palate, I just can't take a, a stronger cigar like that in the morning. And then as the day kind of goes on, I do reach for the more more fuller-bodied uh, cigars. So, Jorge, you did say that uh, you, you have a, a retail background, obviously, uh, and you still own retail stores today. What are some of the best-selling cigars in your retail stores? Oh, a Padron, Tatuaje. Um, I'm super impressed with um, the Wawenses are doing great from Nick Melillo. We're really excited to get our Sobre de Mesas from Saka. The Ligas sell great. We sell great cigars. My my specialty in retail is the premium, the hard to get. You know, I don't do a lot of, I don't do any mass market. And I, I really don't, you know, I distinguish myself by editing our inventories. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to like, you know, the more exciting artisanal stuff. Or in your book, um, The Tobacconist Handbook, you, you have a chapter on pipes. And I think... 
that cigar smokers fall into, you know, a couple of different categories when it comes to pipes. I think there's a probably pretty big percentage of cigar smokers that are like, ah, I just, I don't, I don't know enough about pipes to really get into it. There's maybe a couple of people that dabbled, and then there's a much smaller percentage that I think enjoy both pipes and cigars. What advice do you have for the people who smoke cigars today? Um, that really want to try a pipe, but, you know, are just kind of lost uh, in terms of knowing where to even begin? You know, to back in this university and our curriculum is like a giant bullseye for every opinionated person in the world, uh, in our world of luxury tobacco. Who are they to dictate and blah, blah, blah. And the biggest criticism we get is we do not cover pipes enough. Our, our final exams for certification have approximately 15% of the questions devoted to pipes, pipe tobaccos, because you need to understand all of the families of tobacco to understand dark air cured tobaccos, which are cigar tobaccos, and then all of the light tobaccos, Orientals, Burleys, Virginias, that type of thing, mm -hmm. go into pipes and then cigarettes. We take a lot of heat for not getting into pipes. But there is no consumer in the planet more peculiar than the pipe smoker. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have customers in all tobacconists that will grab a pipe and you'll sit there for two hours, micro inspecting. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that in your book. You said that you said the exact thing, that they're very, very particular and they'll spend a lot more time making their purchase decisions. So pipe smokers complain, and you can see it on Amazon where we have like a four point five rating or whatever on, a, on four and a half stars on the book, but the complaints are not enough on pipes. Well, pipes and pipe tobaccos are about 5% of the industry and our curriculum covers it much more than that percentage, right? Because mm -hmm. when we train tobacconists, we don't train cigar salespeople, we train tobacconists. So we want you to understand history, context, fundamentals, and to understand all that, you have to understand the broad spectrum of the industry and the business and all the families of tobacco. To appreciate a cigar, you have to appreciate what light tobaccos are and what dark tobaccos are and the differences in processing and some of the differences that occur in processing like Virginia's are the highest in sugar content. So they require flu curing. Periques have this barrel fermentation. So there's so many complexities, but we take a lot of heat for not being pipe focused, but we really give more attention to pipes then the dollar figures and sales numbers would account for in the industry as a whole. So I'm not sure I remember your question, but I really like to, if I'm smoking a great cigar and I want to nub it, I'll put it in a pipe and smoke it. Oh, interesting. Interesting. That's, that's, I'm going to try that now that you, you suggested that. I'd be um, really good for that. So uh, if someone wants to get into pipes, like how do you suggest they – they get started uh, in pipes. Like, which tobaccos do you recommend? Which pipes do you recommend? Gosh, you know, pipes smell great. I don't get the same mouthfeel and olfactory stimulation from those light tobaccos. Um, I, I recommend you start with aromas, but a cigar smoke, cigars are much more earthier. Mm. If you're a cigar smoker and you want to start smoking pipes, oriental pipe tobaccos are the most similar in aroma characteristics. So those are grown in like arid climates in the Mediterranean, right? So they're small leaves and they smell most similar to cigars. So start with that. But the, what happens with pipe tobaccos is the majority of the business and the industry is aromatics. And so you smell caramel, raisins, vanilla, cherry. So if that's what you're attracted to, then go for that. But if you want to smoke a pipe and you want something close to a cigar, smoke oriental tobaccos and that's the best advice I can give you, mm. I think. And buy a basket pipe. Don't spend $250 right. on a crazy right. pipe. Start with a $50 pipe. You know, it's sad because 50 years ago, if you're buying estate pipes, uh, you're buying a Dunhill, let's say from the 50s, that briar, which is the burl of the heath tree that grows on the roots under the ground, 50 years ago, that pipe burl might have been 100 years old. Nowadays, the burl you get and the burl we make pipes from is maybe 10 years old, 15 years old. So the grain is not as tight. It's not as aesthetically magnificent. But it's like the pine in your house, too. Uh, you could buy pine now. It's garbage pine. We grow it to grow pine. Mm -hmm. But 50 years ago, you got pine and it was gorgeous. So, but start slow. Don't get crazy. 
and uh, you'll figure it out. Oriental tobaccos are the most similar to cigar tobaccos. Mm -hmm. I'd also add finding a good retail tobacconist to help you with that process is key, right? Oh, yeah. Let me add that part. Sure. (laughs) So for uh, Tobacconist University, for those of us uh, listening that aren't, aren't familiar uh, with Tobacconist University, um, how do people get started and, and what are the different uh, certifications they can obtain from Tobacconist University? Well, we started with our uh, industry-wide, our CRT degree, Certified Retail Tobacconist degree, and that is for retail tobacconists. You have to work in retail to get that. We recommend you have 500 hours of experience before you take the test. Um, then there's a certified Salesforce tobacconist or CST. And that's for salespeople that go mm-hmm. from store to store. Um, and either of those two, those are professional degrees. All of those people can eventually become certified master tobacconists if they get the apprenticeship hours and they do their due diligence and make an academic contribution. So I'm um, sorry. So to get the master tobacconist, you have to be a certified uh, sales tobacconist. Did you say? You have to be either certified retail mm-hmm. or certified Salesforce tobacconist. Okay. And the, the requirements are a little different for each one, mm-hmm. but those are the only two professional degrees we have. Our other degree is a certified consumer tobacconist degree, and that is for consumers. It's half the test, half the difficulty, and it's not a professional degree. It's more about self-satisfaction, improving fundamentals, and in the process, um, you know, satisfying your own desires. But it is not a professional degree. Mm-hmm. And, and how do people, uh, most of the people listening would be going for the uh, consumer tobacconist certification. So how, how would someone initiate that process and, and how do they uh, proceed to getting the certification? Wow, well, this is an exciting question. I'm sure you're very excited to hear the answer. We are currently beta testing a new system. Um, Originally, and up until about a month ago, you had to go to a certified retail tobacconist to have them log you in to the the website and the final exam. So this has not been released publicly. You're the first human being to hear this outside of our offices. But if you go to the website, you'll see it converting over now slowly. The new Certified Consumer Tobacconist Degree, CCT program, you can get on the website for $100. You pay. You accept, first of all, the Code of Ethics and Standards, mm-hmm. which is fundamental and key to every tobacconist degree. Before you become an apprentice, you accept this code. Then you become an apprentice. Then you study, and when you're ready as a consumer, you can take the test. Now, the new program is a $100 program. Consumers can take the test and immediately they become a member of the CRA. We take part of that money and we give it to the CRA. Nice. And you're the first person, human being, to hear of this really outside of our office. That's awesome. Thank you. So the difference is they they don't need to have a retail shop uh, to associate with to be able to get the uh, consumer tobacco certification. You don't have to go to the retailer anymore. Mm -hmm. But... You do still pick a CRT or Certified Retail Tobacconist as your mentor. Mm -hmm. They can help you or you can ignore them. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Before you needed them to log you into the exam. Okay. You you don't need that anymore. You can do it on on your own. Um, But they're still available to you. And what we're trying to do is build benefits and privileges and value added so that, for example, if you go to my stores or certain other Certified Retail Tobacconists and you're a consumer tobacconist, you can get you can get discounts, access to events, special privileges, and access as a CCT or Certified Consumer Tobacconist. So that's developing. But most importantly, you can be home, sign up, take the test, and immediately become a CRA member and become a Certified Tobacconist all in one fell swoop. That's excellent. That's excellent. We're still beta testing it, though. Please let me say that we are still in beta testing mode, and we're working particularly and specifically on a code of ethics and standards that serves the CRA's goals, consumer goals, consumer rights goals, and TU's goals. So you can do it now, but it's not exactly perfect. Yeah, when I did it, I chose the the shop next door to our studio, which is the Havana Cigar Club, uh, where there's a certified retail tobacconist, Todd Descola, who's been on the show before. 
Um, and I was able to, you know, pay my hundred dollars and start studying and, and get ready for the test. And um, I didn't know the CRA link. Now I'm already a CRA member, but I think that's a great incentive for people who really like cigars, which is, you know, everyone listening to the show is a cigar geek. This is a great way to get a certification, to learn about cigars and get a membership to CRA. I, I think that's great, Jorge. Nice job. And even if you're already a member, we're still giving them the money so they can use that That's to great. further all of our goals. Um, you know, there's no better place to put your money. Mm. No, I agree. And uh, so talk a little bit about the book um, that I have here. This An awesome the, book. This is the uh, Tobacconist uh, Handbook, which you can buy on Amazon, which I bought, bought my copy uh, on Amazon. Uh, it's great. Like I said before, it's the uh, illustrious bathroom reading that I've got going on now and, and takes you through everything, and it's a great uh, reference. Um, so, Jorge, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the book, what's in the book, and uh, w you know who's the audience for the book. The book is super lame. <laughs> it's not lame. I, I like reading it a lot. It, uh, it almost killed me to write it. Um, but it's about fundamentals. It's not literature. You know, it's, it's what to use about. We're not sexy. We're not fun like your website. Mm -hmm. We're not entertaining. I don't have your personality. I'm not fun, fancy, and amusing. Oh, but we've been having fun, Jorge. Come on now. We'll see what you blog later on. But <laughs> I, my point is it, it's a TU and that book, the Tobacconist Handbook, it's the only book ever geared towards establishing fundamentals. Let's agree on something as an industry. You know, this is true, that's true. This is black and white, that's gray. But let's have that discussion. Let's not just pontificate to people what we think. A lot of cigar books are vanity projects or verbal masturbation. Can I say that? Yes, okay? like, yes you can. <laughs> so it's not a sexy book. It's not an exciting read, but you have to understand, I had three stores in three states. I had to figure out a way to train my employees. We turned this to back in this university. We have almost 500 stores in our program now. Let's make sure that a tobacconist knows how to fill a lighter or how to assess the quality of a pipe or understands that air curing comes before fermentation right. when you're right. talking about dark tobaccos. <clears throat> so... It's not a fun read, and I'm not telling you cute anecdotes. I'm not Zeno Davidoff telling you about how I smoked a cigar with the sheik of, you know, Wankakistan. This is about establishing professional fundamentals as an industry so that we can build credibility. So that's what the Tobacconist Handbook is about. You should buy this book. Everybody should buy this book before they buy every other book. Mm -hmm. All the other books can be great, but at least... Let's distinguish between opinion and facts. And in the Tobacconist Handbook and throughout the Tobacconist University curriculum, we're always trying to distinguish facts and separate them from opinion and not pont pontificate taste. It's extremely important. And so that's what the Tobacconist Handbook is. Fundamentals for passionate consumers and professional tobacconists. And there's never been a book like it. It's the only one of its kind because most books or either vanity projects or marketing gimmicks or passion projects. But this is a book for professionals and passionate consumers. Yeah, I, well, I really, I mean, being, being in the computer field, right, I've read a, lot, read a lot of technical manuals, and this is the manual for cigars. And oftentimes I'll say the same thing, Jorge, you know, I'll tell people, you got to go read the manual. Like there are certain books when you get into certain areas of computers, I'm like, look, it's not a glorious read, right? It's not a novel, but you got to read this manual. And then once you read the manual, then you can maybe go read some other stuff. But you got to have the fundamentals. And, and this book is exactly what you said, Jorge. And it, it's really great to get all of the straight facts. And it's funny. Recently, we've been running a little kind of like a quiz show uh, on this show uh, asking questions. And some of the questions are derived from your material and if ever anyone were to question the question, they say, well, I got the question and the answer from the tobacconist handbook, and this is the facts. And it's really been great to kind of level set and all have that same level of information. Well, I really appreciate that. Um, all we do is establish fundamentals. 
you want to become a cigar geek, build it on top of a strong foundation. Build it on top of that. But I've heard so much nonsense in this industry in over 20 years of being in it. So let's just build our opinions on top of facts. That's the most important thing. Um, and then you can embellish and do anything we want on top of that. But let's agree. One of the most difficult things in the tobacconist handbook and our curriculum and in the world is how do you teach fermentation? So when we teach fermentation, we're constantly qualifying, saying this is a model. We basically tell you this is BS. It's not BS. Yes, it works here or there or in Cuba. It's a two stage model, but everybody ferments differently. Mm. So how can I teach fermentation? How can you teach it by typing about it or writing about it? You, you can't even teach. You could spend 10 years learning how to ferment tobacco and still not know how to ferment tobacco. Mm. So oftentimes we teach models to teach principles. But thank you for what you said, because really all we want to do is establish fundamentals and build up your professionalism or your expertise or your powerful, strong, valid opinions, but build them on real fundamentals. When, when you uh, mentor your retailers, right, and you uh, have materials for retailers, what do you do to help retailers help the consumer find the right cigar for them? Wow. Well, there is nobody more difficult to lead than a retail tobacconist. Um, they're all such individualists. They're the greatest Americans and the biggest pains in the asses imaginable. Mm -hmm. You know, there it's the best of what it is to be free. And look, I have a friend. He broke my heart. And he's still one of my best friends. Phil Ledbetter. He's a general manager of Updown Tobacco in Chicago. I've been there. Phil's there. All right, so you know it's an amazing shop. Amazing if you shop. Know, yes. If you know Phil, you know he's an amazing character. He's a great tobacconist. And uh, I was there for a Padron event last year, this year. Um, and he said, um, what we do is frivolous. And I was like taken back. I said, oh, my God, I've devoted my whole life to this nonsense. Mm -hmm. And in the end, he's right. But it's the greatest expression of freedom to be involved in this. Are we um, saving starving children or curing tuberculosis or whatever? No. Um, but what a great opportunity we have you know we just had veterans day right there's people sacrificing their lives and their careers for us to enjoy our freedoms and um it's not frivolous it is frivolous on the one hand but on the other hand it's the greatest expression of freedom and uh, of a life well lived to have the opportunity we're not cave people you know just dying to eat and drink um what a great country and um opportunity we have to enjoy these luxury products and that's what they are and that's why we smoke, right? It's a luxury. Mm -hmm. You don't need to smoke a cigar. It just makes your life better. Um, and so it is a privilege. Privilege is a big word. It made me a little sad. So, you know, I think he makes a good point, but I think he was rubbing it in. So it's uh, to appreciate the opportunity to smoke great cigars. We're in the golden age of cigar making. Um, you know, let's hope the FDA doesn't kill that for us. Mm. But no, for uh, sure, a real uh, privilege. Yeah, I don't. I thought uh, that was very well said, and I think uh, say, stating that cigars make your life better, uh, you couldn't sum it up any any better than that. Um, so I'm going to go to a totally different topic. From Tobacco's University, you have uh, some uh, blending kits or tasting kits. Can you tell us about those? No, we don't. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Or well, listen, you know, we do most of what we do is free. So and I spent a fortune traveling everywhere, doing video and learning and somewhere along the line. I said, why, why can't we make products that translate all of the education that we're doing and make them come to life, so to speak? Right. Instead of typing it on the interweb or a blog or a book, why can't we create a product that makes the education come to life? So like four or five years ago, we started going down this path of trying to, as I'm traveling around anyway, learning this stuff and translating it into content, why don't we create products that make the content come to life? So it's called R&D Cigars, stands for Research and Development. We were doing it anyway, so we just decided, hey, let's translate it into a product to make it tangible. 
um, tactile, you know, a sensory experience. And uh, our first R&D cigar was in 2014. It was released, uh, Brazilian Corojo, made by the Fuego family. Jose Fuego was the first um, person. First of all, the Fuegos are from the Corojo farm in Cuba. And Jose Fuego was the first guy to take this seed to Brazil and grow it. Jesus Fuego, his son, was the first guy to turn it into a cigar. And so we created a cigar based on that. And then this year, we had an extraordinary opportunity to work with A.J. Fernandez, who had a tiny, tiny batch of what we call um, technically or PA Connecticut broadleaf, or it was a Connecticut seed. They took to Pennsylvania and they grew it there with the Amish, hmm. still a broadleaf seed. They grow broadleaf in PA. They grow broadleaf in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. First time, to, to my knowledge, that a seed from Connecticut, like the Ligas have, mm -hmm. um, that uh, Nick is famous for, Nick Garagua. <laughs> We'll get to Pennsylvania and the Amish grew it. We couldn't film them because you can't film them, put them on video. They don't like it. <laughs> That's interesting. So we put that on a cigar. I was lucky enough to get that because AJ Fernandez is a cousin of Jesus Fuego. So he was willing to give it to Jesus Fuego and he was willing to give it to TU. And so the second R&D release of 2015 was this PA Connecticut Broadleaf um, cigar, which is an experimental wrapper. Only 20,000 cigars were made. And then we got another one coming next year and one after that. So we're just constantly working on these uh, experimental products, right? And then we develop content on them in the R&D lab on the TU website. That We call them certified cigars. They can only be sold by certified tobacconists. Mm -hmm. And in the R&D lab, we have educational content. So you can click on the GPS coordinates on that in that lab on the page and go see the plantation. You learn about every seed varietal. You know, it's a really a way to make the product come to life. Mm -hmm. So more than just, oh, we use this Criollo or this Habano, we really try and bring it to life as much as possible to and, enhance that educational experience. And now inside of the, the R&D kit, you get all of the Peritos that make up the filler tobacco. Is that correct? We make the cigar and then we make what's called Pudo components. So every time we make a cigar... And cigar makers hate this, by the way. They all go, <laughs> oh, my God, really? I got to make this for you? <laughs> make the cigar. And then we make, uh, in the case of the last two versions, we had five ingredients. And we have them make, um, you can call them calillas, puros, puritos. There's a million names yep. for it. But you take each ingredient and you roll it into a tiny hand roll. Hold on. I'm sure I got one right here. I have a walk-in humidor in my house. But this is how... <laughs> I roll. I hear you. No, I'm just my, I have some nice cabinets at home, but here in the studio, I storm in coolers with Bovita packs. Yeah, but, you know, makes me happy. And what we do, these are poodles, right? Let me see. Mm -hmm. Poodle components. Oh, you can't get it. No, you got it. Yeah, I can see it. But we don't tell you what it is on the band. We have a code because we want to drag you to the R&D lab. Right. So that you're forced to go and learn. But it's amazing because... There's, let's say on, on the last two series of cigars, we had five ingredients. You'll smoke two or three of them, you'll like them, and then you'll be like, ah, I hated the other two. But you really, really, really like the cigar. But it's so educational mm. because you maybe you only like two or three of the components. You really like the cigar. You loved it, but you hated two of the components. Mm -hmm. So that's an amazing educational process. And our tagline is educating your mind and your palate. And it's compelling and it really resonates. And at the very least, if you want to know what Ometepe tastes like, that island in Lake Nicaragua mm -hmm. with volcanoes, well, we have the components that you can smoke them. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing way to anchor the flavor experience. So are, are the uh, perritos, are they all filler tobacco? Or uh -huh. do you get to smoke the binder and the wrapper and all the fillers in their individual perritos? In their, in their totally, the wrapper is the wrapper. Mm-hmm. Binder is the binder. Nice. The three fillers are separate. So you smoke absolutely mm -hmm. pure tobacco. A lot of, uh, I think Davidoff has like a tasting thing where they break it up. Yeah, Hanky Kellner does one, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, there's no bigger, I'm the, no Hanky Kellner. But it's a different process. We're just giving you pure fundamental tobacco. Um, it's not even going to smoke great. You're going to say, oh, it's not a, it's not a premium cigar. It is because it's long filler. Right. But the ash isn't going to be pretty. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it is what it is. But that's what we want you to have the cigar maker experience. Mm. 
And what we and do you get? Do you get the fully blended cigar as well as all of the individual components? You get both. Yeah, you well, you can buy you buy the cigars, mm-hmm. and then you can buy the components separately. Mm-hmm. Or a lot of retailers they bundle them. Yep. But it's a separate package. You buy us the long. We make three or four large vitolas, robusto, corona, okay. Toro, okay. Churchill, and then the component packs are separate. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's up to you. It, when you go to a certified retailer like Up Down in Chicago mm-hmm. or Georgetown in D.C. or Nat Sherman in New York, they're all certified tobacconists. You can buy the cigar. We recommend you buy a large Vitola. You buy two and then smoke a large Vitola, smoke the components, go to the R&D lab, learn about it, and then smoke the second large Vitola. I got you. And it's the greatest educational experience you'll ever have. Guaranteed. I, I strongly encourage all of our listeners to do that. I think, uh, you know, I've been through uh, a few blending seminars uh, to this day, and uh, I haven't done the, the Tobacco University uh, R&D kit yet, but it's definitely on my list, and I, I, I highly encourage it. It's, it's an eye-opening experience. So, awesome. Uh, Dave, did you have any uh, closing questions for Jorge? Do you have any questions that were burning on your mind or... Yeah, well, first off, I love all the the passion about cigars. It's been great to listen to. And I guess the question I have is, you are talking before about FDA and and stuff, and we've been talking mainly about, you know, Uh what cigar smokers can get out of um, tobacco in this university and things like that. But for you, Jorge, what do you think are some things that the general public – should know about the cigars to get more informed when we're in an age with restrictions and stuff like that. Okay. Sorry, Dave. I got the dog. <laughs> First question, by the way, uh, that was Bobby. That's our mascot. Uh, <laughs> nice. Um, great question. As a retail tobacconist, one of the most compelling things that happens is somebody goes on vacation to the Dominican Republic, Mexico, whatever. And they see a cigar get rolled. They hated cigars. They didn't like the smell, whatever their story is. And then they come back and they go, wow, I saw them make it. And I never really was into cigars. And then I saw them roll one and it was amazing. And then I was on the beach and they were relaxed. And on vacation, they smoked. And I loved it. So many new customers come that way hmm. because they lack an appreciation for the artistry, for the amazing effort that goes into it. And at that point, they have no idea. It took three to five years. And the crazy sacrifices and nuance that we were talking about earlier to create that work of art. So that's one thing. I'm currently building the first tobacconist university lounge in Princeton, New Jersey, which is why I'm dressed like a refugee. I could say that because I am a refugee (laughs) or the child of refugees. Um, And my biggest ambition is in a very liberal town of Princeton, New Jersey, that people walk by that store that don't like cigars, don't love cigars, don't think about cigars. Maybe they don't like the smell. But when they walk by the windows, they look inside and they go, wow, that place is really beautiful. Oh, and then it just make them stop and understand that this is not the caricature industry that cartoons have made it out to be, that anti-smoking people have made it out to be. The artistry it takes to take a rough bunch of leaves and turn them into these beautiful products is extraordinary. Um, you talk about the Placencias in Nicaragua, the Padrones are end of the Fuentes. What they contribute, they create middle class jobs in these third world, second world countries. Um, the Placencias have daycare. They have doctors in their factories. It's unbelievable the value, the quality, the caliber of people that are in this industry and what it takes to make this product to the uninitiated to the ignorant is extraordinary. And the more we can do to make people appreciate and understand it, I think a lot of the people that don't would. So I appreciate that question. I hope I answered, answered it intelligently and I could go on and on, but I'm sure. No, that's, that's a great answer, Jorge. Um, right now uh, we're a little over time. So I want to conclude the interview by asking you five ridiculous questions that we ask every single one of our guests. So, Jorge, are you ready to play five questions with the Stoey Geeks? Let's do it. Three words to describe yourself. Super duper awesome. 
If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? A large machete. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? The Tobacco in His Handbook. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? First. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Uh, uh, where's Waldo? Nice. Roseanne Barr. <laughs> Excellent. I, I judge people I want to hang out with by their answers to those questions, and I think every single guest we've had here on the Story Geek Show, I want to hang out with. So, Jorge, we totally need to hang out, dude. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being on the show, Jorge. It was wonderful having you. We're going to in, uh, invite you back because I, I feel like we only like scratched the surface uh, about tobacco and cigars and, and, and everything that goes into it and all of your knowledge. So thank I'm you so much. I'm a deep wound. I'm a deep wound. I have a lot more to give. <laughs> That's it. Jorge, thank you very much, thank everyone. You. Please check out Tobacconist University. Sign up. Get your certification. Get your R&D kits. Do that, please, Tobacconist University. Um, so with that, we're going to take a short break. Come back. We're going to do our debonair ideal segment. Then after that, we're going to do Stogies of the Week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. 